I'm going to make you an offer that you can't refuse. You might recognize that quote, that veiled threat from The Godfather, a gangster. But there are some who believe that salvation is an offer that God makes to us that we can't refuse. The Godfather with a threat makes sense, but does God making us an offer that we can't refuse make sense? You should know that there is a branch of Christianity called Reformed Theology or Calvinists who believe that salvation is an offer that we can't refuse. This doctrine is called irresistible grace. And grace that is irresistible hardly seems like grace to us. It seems a contradiction of terms. Grace that is irresistible doesn't seem to be very gracious. Today, I would like to continue our study on Calvinism, on Reformed theology, and look at this fourth part of five that makes up the core of Reformed theology about salvation, of Calvinism, total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, which we looked at last week, and this week, I, T-U-L-I-P, for TULIP, I is irresistible grace. Hi, I'm Pastor Jeff Hartman from Troy First Baptist Church in Troy, North Carolina, and we continue our study tonight in Calvinism, Reformed theology, irresistible grace. Is salvation really an offer we can't refuse? I want to allow Calvinists, Reformed theologians, they call these the doctrines of grace, I want to allow them to define the term. They don't like irresistible grace, they like efficacious grace. But here is how they build their case. This is from a book, Five Points of Calvinism by Steele and Thomas. On page 48, they reason each member of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, participates in and contributes to the salvation of sinners. We all agree to that. The Father marked out those who were to be saved. That's what we looked at two weeks ago, unconditional election. The Son came into the world and secured thou their salvation. That's what we looked at last week, their belief in limited atonement. They continue, but these two great acts, the Father and the Son, the Father choosing, the Son dying, election and redemption, do not complete the work of salvation. The Holy Spirit never fails to bring those to salvation, those sinners whom he personally calls to Christ. This is irresistible grace. He inevitably applies salvation to every sinner he intends to save. That is irresistible grace. And I want you to see the relentless logic of this Calvinistic system of thought. They believe that we are totally depraved, that we're dead in sin, that we couldn't choose to receive salvation even if we wanted to. And so in order for us to be saved, God has to do it. And so they say the Father unconditionally elects us. God chooses only those he wants to save and damns the rest. And then the Son dies only for the elect, limited atonement. They like to call it particular redemption. We saw it last week. And irresistible grace is the Holy Spirit's part of forcing this salvation upon us. We can't choose it. So the Holy Spirit chooses it for us. The Spirit saves only the elect. It makes sense, but is it biblical? They continue with their case on page 48. Men are by nature dead in sin. Remember, that's the first part of their tulip, total depravity. They are of themselves unable and unwilling to forsake their evil ways and to turn to Christ for mercy. No amount of external threatenings or promises will cause blind, deaf, dead, rebellious sinners to bow before Christ. Remember, the overarching theme for them is we are dead in Christ. If you say someone's dead, you don't even have to say they're blind or deaf. But how can someone who is dead also be rebellious? You see, it's necessary from the human side for God to force salvation upon us. Otherwise, none of us would be saved. Their driving metaphor is that we are dead in Christ, but that is not the only metaphor the Bible uses and it can't describe everything about us, is the image of God lost in us. They continue on pages 48 and 49. The Holy Spirit performs a work of grace within the sinner, which inevitably brings him to faith in Christ. Thus, the once dead sinner, 
and blind and deaf and rebellious, is drawn to Christ by the inward supernatural call of the Spirit who through regeneration creates within him faith and repentance. Here's where it really gets strange for most of us. The Holy Spirit gives us faith and repentance. And so here's their relentless logic. Total depravity means humans are unable to repent or have faith. Now, we said three weeks ago that that's not biblical, but if that were true, then it would follow that irresistible grace would be absolutely necessary. The Holy Spirit would give repentance and faith to certain humans. You've got to hand it to Calvinists. They are relentlessly logical. I gave my secretary, who's rather vertically challenged or short, a surprise one day. I put a sign up very high where she couldn't reach it because she's so short. It says you've got to hand it to short people because they can't reach it. Well, you've got to hand it to Calvinists. They are relentlessly logical. I'm going to make a case tonight that they're not relentlessly biblical. Here is the surprising result of this logic. They are saying that regeneration and salvation precede repentance and faith. It seems strange to most Christians because we think we believe in Christ and he gives us life. It's hard for us to imagine, and it seems like it's a very hard case to build from the Bible. I'm going to show tonight that it is not a biblical one. Does the Bible teach that repentance and faith are not prerequisites to salvation, but products of salvation? Once God saves us without us receiving him in faith, does he then give us the faith? This is a very key point for Calvinists. For them, repentance and faith are products of salvation, not prerequisites. This is not how we get life in Christ. We get life in Christ first because God chooses and the Holy Spirit irresistibly saves us, and then we place our faith and trust in Christ. This is what they believe, back to that same book, The Five Points, page 49. Although the general outward call of the gospel can be and often is rejected, they admit that, the special inward call of the Spirit never fails. This special call is not made to all sinners, but is issued to the elect only. The Spirit is in no way dependent upon their help or cooperation. Now, I want you to notice two things. They recognize that some people do resist the Holy Spirit, but they then make God's call into some hypothetical dual call. There's a general call that people can and do resist, and there is the special call that God only issues to the elect, and that cannot be resisted. Of course, the Bible doesn't give us two different calls. I also want you to notice that in this case, the Spirit is not dependent on our help or cooperation, which means that we're uninvolved in our salvation. We are only passively used by God. God has faith in himself. He gives us faith and he believes in himself. We don't even have to cooperate. Sounds strange to most of us. They continue on page 48. Because the sinner is given a new nature, the renewed sinner freely and willingly turns to Christ as Lord and Savior. There's another twist. So we understand they tell us that we are not cooperating, that we are not helping in any way, that we don't have faith, that God gives us faith, but then they turn around in the next sentence and say, we freely and willingly turn to Christ. Well, where does irresistible come in? The strange twist is they want to have their cake and eat it too. We don't choose Christ, he chooses us. We don't come to Christ, he saves us and then he makes us come to him. But then they tell us we freely and willingly turn to Christ because the Holy Spirit irresistibly saves us. They continue on page 49, all those whom God hath predestined unto life, unconditional election, and those only he is pleased to effectually call. That's the name they like, the effectual call. Effectually, effectively drawing them to Jesus Christ, yet so as they come most freely, being made willing by his grace. And they quote from the Westminster Confession of Faith to that effect. I want to make their case for us. 
Is God's grace irresistible? They say yes, and here is the case in Steele and Thomas. Number one, they say, the Spirit is active in salvation. Now, that's strange. No one argues. No Arminian, no Baptist, no provisionist believes that the Spirit is inactive in salvation. This in no way proves irresistible grace. But after giving a long list of proof texts, many of which have nothing to do with the subject, Romans 8, 14, 1 Corinthians 2, 1 Corinthians 6, 1 Corinthians 12, 2 Corinthians 3. For instance, Romans 8, for as many are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Okay, Romans 8, 14. In what way does that prove that the Holy Spirit irresistibly saves people without their cooperation? It doesn't may not have anything to do even with salvation. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, not saved by the Spirit of God. Or 2 Corinthians 3, 6, the Spirit gives life. Yes, but that doesn't mean the Holy Spirit gives life apart from our cooperation or help. We're going to see later on that none of this means that we are to be inactive. Yes, the Holy Spirit is active, but does that mean we are inactive? The second leg of their proof is the Spirit is the author of the new birth. Yes, again, everyone agrees that the Spirit is the author of the new birth. But I want you to notice that some of the proof texts that they list here, like John 1, 12, and 13, to as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, doesn't even mention the Holy Spirit, let alone prove this point. If we look at one of those, Titus 3, 5, according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Yes, the Holy Spirit renews us, but this doesn't tell us that the Holy Spirit renews us without our permission, without our invitation, without our faith. So the Spirit is the author of the new birth, agreed, but that does not prove the point or even begin to prove the point. They have other proof texts like Deuteronomy 36, Ezekiel 36. Ezekiel 36 says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. Yes, that is true. But that doesn't say without our cooperation or help, God will not. Actually, I want you to notice that in any of these verses, Deuteronomy 30 through 2 Corinthians 5, not one of them even mentioned the Holy Spirit. So how does this prove that the Spirit is the author of the new birth? Other proof texts include John 5, 21. As the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom he will. Again, there is no mention of the Holy Spirit. Here we see the Son giving life. The Spirit is the author of the new birth, raising from death to spiritual life. Again, it's God in Ephesians 2 who gives us life. It's Jesus who gives us life in John chapter 5. But none of these verses, not one of these proof texts, place salvation, regeneration, before faith and repentance. And I will challenge you to find one verse anywhere in the Scripture that places regeneration before faith. The third leg of their proof of salvation coming irresistibly to those of us God calls Third, the Spirit reveals the secrets of God. Again, I agree with this. All Christians agree with this. But all of these proof texts, what do they tell us about grace coming irresistibly? Well, John 6, 37, here's a verse that they really like. Jesus says in the red letters, all that the Father gives me will come to me. Well, that sounds irresistible, right? All the ones that God gives to me will come to me. Oh, okay, I can start to see maybe their case. John 6, 44, no one can come to me unless the Father draws him. So if we put these two verses together, the Father draws him, no one can come, but all that the Father gives to me will come, that uh, I can start to see it, right? We'll deal with those verses later. Number four in their case, the Spirit gives faith and repentance. Remember, this is the key concept. Faith comes after regeneration. God saves us, and then we respond by receiving him. And the long list of proof texts includes Acts chapter 5, verse 31. God gives repentance to Israel, 
or Acts 11.18, to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance. We read these, most of these, and we read them naturally to say God has given us the opportunity to repent. We don't read this automatically to say God has given us the gift of repentance. Repentance we see as our response. When God grants repentance, he gives us the opportunity to repent. That's what we see, but they see here God giving repentance. Therefore, God gives faith, and our faith and repentance are gifts of God forced upon us that salvation comes before faith and repentance come. One of their other proof texts is 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 25. He says, If God will... If God will perhaps grant them repentance so that they might know the truth. So here you see, God might grant them repentance so that they might know the truth. That says God grants repentance, but it doesn't say that God gives them the repentance to believe. It says he gives them an opportunity to repentance. We certainly could read that there. I want you to see their order is very clear and they insist upon it. Regeneration comes before faith. The question is, is that biblical? And we'll deal with that in a moment. But let's continue their case. And remember, their case absolutely depends on regeneration, salvation, coming before faith. Here's the fifth and final proof of irresistible grace. And this is really the only one that is germane. The Spirit effectually, irresistibly, calls the elect only. Now here is the long list of proof texts, and I would challenge you to look up every one of them. Do any of them say God only calls the elect? I'll answer it for you, I'll save you some time. None of them do. Actually, many of them are not even about being called to be saved. For instance, 1 Corinthians 1, Paul talks about being called to be an apostle. Well, that's to service. That's not to salvation. Maybe one, Romans 8.30, whom he predestined, these he also called. Romans 8.30. You can see where they might take that verse out of context to mean that God predestined some to be saved. That's something that has to be proved, and we saw two weeks ago that it doesn't really seem to be biblical. These he also called. He only called those he predestined. If you take that verse out of context, it might say what they wanted to say. But here are the two main problems I have with this case. Because the Holy Spirit is active in salvation, everyone, every Christian agrees with that, does not mean that we are to be inactive. Could it mean that? Possibly. But there is no way that is implied. To say that the Holy Spirit is very active in salvation does not mean that we are to be inactive. And second, because the Holy Spirit effectually, irresistibly, calls the elect, doesn't mean that he only calls the elect. These things are not mutually exclusive. So that's their case. I wouldn't say it's a strong case. Numbers 1 through 4 don't even approach the point. Number five attempts to with a bunch of verses that don't deal with the subject. Here is my case for resistible grace. They've talked to us about irresistible grace. I would suggest that any grace that is irresistible is not really grace at all. Here is what I believe is the strong biblical case for resistible grace. The Bible talks about God's call in universal terms. The universal call. What they do is dismiss all contradictory passages with a hypothetical universal call. There is a call, I would call it disingenuous, a call for people to be saved who God has not elected to salvation and Christ does not die for, and neither will the Holy Spirit give them the faith and repentance they need. So the call is not really a genuine call. They say this outward general call, page 48, extended to the elect and non-elect alike, will not bring sinners to Christ. So this is an insincere call. Come to me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, well, all ye that I have called who are heavy laden. You see, there are some 
who are not actually called, although God issues a universal call, he's not really calling them. Is there a call that you can't answer? If someone calls you on the phone, but they call the wrong number, you can't answer it, right? And so is that all this is? God not actually calling everybody? This universal call that is not a genuine call is manufactured. It's not actually biblical. Yes, they love to quote, we said earlier, John chapter 6, verse 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And so they call this a clincher. They love this verse and they use it. But what they ignore is what Jesus says a few chapters later in John chapter 12, verse 32. If I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all peoples to myself. Now, if you were here last week and you saw the case for limited atonement, you know that largely Calvinists ignore the alls and the everys and somehow turn them into all Christians. And so is Jesus saying in John 12, 32, if I'm lifted up, I will draw all kinds of people? Or is he saying, I will draw all peoples that are elect? All seems to mean all. So the Father calls people, and only people who he draws to himself, only if God takes the first step, can anyone come to Christ. We can't take the first step. We can't come to him on our own. But Jesus says you can't come unless the Father draws you. And Jesus then turns around and says, God draws you. He's going to draw all people to yourself, to himself. There's also a verse that they love. Few are chosen, Matthew chapter 20, verse 16, and chapter 22, verse 21. They love the few are chosen, but what they forget is the first part. Many are called. And he's saying there are many who are called who aren't chosen. Does that mean God issues a call only to those few? What about those others who are called? Are they genuinely, sincerely called? I would suggest the Bible says clearly God calls all to repent. Actually, that's what we see in our second one. There is a universal call, and it's a genuine, sincere call to all. Secondly, the Bible tells us that we are responsible to respond to that call. This is the universal message of the Old and the New Testament. For instance, Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 16 and 17. If your heart turns away so that you do not hear, and you're drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I announce you today that you shall surely perish. I'm going to hold you responsible for how you respond. Now, if they can only respond correctly if God chooses to give them the ability to do it, then how can he blame them for not doing it? God is holding them responsible for not turning away. If we can turn away, then it's not irresistible grace, right? Well, that's the Old Testament, they might say. How about Hebrews chapter 3, verses 7 through 10? Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the day of rebellion. I was angry with that generation. Why? Because I didn't give them irresistible grace, and so they didn't come? No. I gave them grace. It was resistible, and they resisted. You see, God holds us responsible for responding to his generous offer of salvation through repentance and faith. But we have the ability to resist him, and we can harden our hearts. He says, if you listen, that's up to us, not up to him. It's not up to who God chooses and who God doesn't choose. It's up to our hearts to respond to him. That's what it says in Romans chapter 2, verse 5, in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation in the righteous judgment of God. God is righteous to judge those of us who resist his grace. Is it righteous and just for God to have wrath against people for not repenting who could indeed not repent because they were dead in sin? and they weren't unconditionally elected, and Christ didn't even die for them, and God didn't give them irresistible grace, how can God hold them accountable for something that was not their responsibility? It seems unjust to us, and I would say that's because it is. The third leg of our case for resistible grace is that the Bible clearly teaches faith and repentance precede salvation. 
It almost goes without saying, but everywhere we read about the order, it always comes out the same way. For instance, in the very end of the book of John, John says, John 20, 31, these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Now that Greek participle means, if you believe, then you will have life. Life comes after believing. This is the way the Bible teaches it clearly, over and over again. Can this be reversed? No, not grammatically and not theologically. God couldn't have said it any clearer. It can't be living, you may believe in his name. No, he says believing, you may have life in his name. It's throughout scripture over and over again. We see it in clear passages like Acts chapter 16, where Paul talks to the Philippian jailer and he says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. He does not say be saved and you will believe. He says, belief precedes regeneration. Faith precedes regeneration. Jesus says, Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, come to me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, all, and I will give you rest. He doesn't say, I will give you rest, and then you can come to me. I will give you salvation, and then you can have faith. No, every time we see over and over again the same order, believe and be saved. Place your faith in Christ and be regenerated. John chapter 3, verse 18. We know John 3, 16. Whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Pretty clear, right? How about verse 18? He who believes in him is not condemned. Again, belief comes, faith comes before regeneration and salvation. John chapter 11, the resurrection of Lazarus. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection of life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. Whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Over and over and over again, God could not make it clearer. There's one thing you must do, believe and you'll have life. He doesn't say, wait for me passively to choose you and then to irresistibly save you. He says, believe in me. That's your responsibility. And if you don't respond, it's your choice. It's your responsibility. Okay, the Bible seems to clearly say it. I'm being generous. It does clearly say it. Point number four in our case for resistible grace. Here's our smoking gun. Last week we talked about a smoking gun verse with limited atonement. If we could produce one verse that said somebody Jesus Christ died for was not saved and went to hell, then we would prove limited atonement was unscriptural. And I gave you that verse. Go back and watch that video. If we can show one person in scripture who resists the will of God, who resists the call of God, then his call is not and cannot be irresistible. Now, Romans 9, 19, Romans 9, 19, Paul says, You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who has resisted his will? Is that saying that we can't resist his will? No, actually, it's not. This is not Paul stating who has resisted his will. This is his imaginary respondent. This is the person who's objecting to Paul's argument here. And he's saying something that is quite logical to us. How can he find fault if we can't resist his will? He's making our case for us. Calvinists love Romans chapter 9, but here is a verse that goes against irresistible grace. It wouldn't be fair of God to judge someone for doing something that God willed for them to do. And according to this system of faith, it is God's will that these people not be saved. Jesus didn't even die for them. He didn't give them an offer of salvation, a genuine offer, God didn't elect them. God doesn't even love them. And so this is not saying no one can resist his will. Actually, throughout Scripture, we see people resisting his will. For instance, in Luke chapter 7, verse 30, the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the will of God for themselves, not having been baptized by him. Case closed, right? They rejected not an insincere offer of God, a universal call. They rejected the will of God for themselves. What was the will of God for them? That they repent, that they be baptized, that they be saved. They chose not to. They rejected it. They resisted God's resistible offer of grace. 
Acts chapter 7, verse 51. You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. The grace of God is often resisted. That's the whole story of the Old Testament as the, as the Israelite people say, we're going to follow your words, Lord, and then they turn away from him. Not because God foreordained it to come to pass, no. And Jesus closes the case for us in Matthew 23, 37. We've used it before in the series. Jesus says in the red letters, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Those who are not gathered, those who don't come to Christ, do they not come to Christ because Christ doesn't want them to? No, Jesus could not be clearer. Jesus wanted them to be saved, but they resisted his will. Not because God was not willing to save them, not because he didn't unconditionally elect them. They didn't come because God chose them, but they rejected his will. The other way of saying it, we have quoted it often in this series, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish. Okay, what does that mean? But he is willing that all should come to repentance. We saw last week, they twist this verse to say what it does not say. Actually, the opposite of what it says. He's not willing that any should perish, not any Christians, but that all, not all Christians, but that all should come to repentance. And everyone who does not come to repentance does so by their own choice. And I like to say, over his dead body, because Christ did die for them in an unlimited atonement. Is this an offer that we cannot refuse? No, very clearly we can, and many do. If it can't be refused, I ask again, is it really possible to still call it grace? If this grace is forced upon someone, it is not willingly received, and it can't even really be called love. Because love that is forced upon someone is not love. That's rape, isn't it? If he indeed coerces us, as R.C. Sproul says in his book, Chosen by God, page 36, God has the raw power to coerce men. God is not required to seek the sinner's permission for doing with the sinner what he pleases, even saving them. God can save men by violating their wills. And this is such a tragedy because this takes the tender love story of the Old and the New Testament, of a God who loves us and woos us and draws us to himself so that we might accept his love. Love that is not accepted willingly is not love at all. God forces himself upon the unwilling. I want you to see, as C.S. Lewis says, the Calvinist makes the most important attribute of God is sovereignty. He's got to be in charge. He's got to be in control. He's all powerful. And indeed, he is all powerful. But God has chosen to give us a choice for the reason God's most important attribute is his love. And love has to be willingly received. So he had to make us in his image able to resist his will. Otherwise, it would not be love. God could not be sovereign in eternity before he made us. So that can't be his most important attribute, C.S. Lewis says. Who was he sovereign over? There was Father, Son, and Spirit, none of them sovereign over the other. But love, God was in eternity before he made the angels, before he made us. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, each loved one another. That's the most important attribute of God. And while they focus on God's power, they miss out on the God of the Old and the New Testament. This grace is not grace. Irresistible grace can't be grace. Because if I force $1,000 on everyone in church, that might sound like grace. You have to take it. No, I don't need it. Give it to someone. No, no, you have to take it. That might be misconstrued as grace. But what if I forced grace, $1,000, on a few people, prejudice or random, and not on others? How would that be grace? How can you force a rescue on a few drowning swimmers and let others die? That's not grace. How can you blame someone for not doing something they can't do? 
This kind of irresistible grace would be to me like condemning a male for not having a baby, getting pregnant, but I can't. That would be like condemning and sending to hell a paraplegic for not being a world-class athlete when they couldn't do any better. Or how about blaming a dead person for not placing their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, if indeed they could not, and God did not give them the opportunity. This irresistible grace is not grace at all, and this is not the gospel. This is not the good news that God loves you, and that he chose you, and that he died for you, and that he is stretching out his arms to you, and willing that you should come. This is the picture of Jesus. He says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your resistible grace, for indeed nothing else would be grace. Thank you for the offer of repentance and faith and salvation. And Lord, I pray that we would not fall for this deception that would take away the love of God and the free offer of salvation to everyone. Whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God, save the church. Save us from this error that would immobilize us in evangelism and actually really cause us to doubt the goodness of the God that we love and serve and who loved us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us.